A series of crises have increased the potential for a serious trouble in Haiti. Politically motivated violent riots against high living costs have thus caused widespread disruption and suffering, toppling the government. In August and September 2008, four tropical storms and hurricanes killed 800 citizens, affected nearly 1 million, exasperated food shortages, and pushed yet more Haitians into poverty. Extensive damage was caused to the infrastructure and agriculture. The global financial crisis is making it difficult for Haiti to become a thriving member of our global community. It is key for the government of Haiti to quickly address all aspects of issues covered by our team of dedicated specialists in hopes to provide wide-ranging stabilization strategies and greater benefits for Haiti's citizens. We have some very interesting topics to touch on today. With us here in the studio are some very important specialists who have come to share their policies on Haiti's economic situation. Amy? Thank you, Ron Burgundy. All issues suffered in our country are easily interrelated. It is key for our team to address all aspects. We have devised four policies we believe will greatly stabilize Haiti's economy and infrastructure. Our policies will serve as the framework for our fully efficient and thriving nation. Thank you, Amy. Our country's major obstacles include the transportation, health, education, and human rights issues. In the next few moments, we will present to you our fiscal and monetary policy recommendations that will surely aid to Haiti's advancement. Thank you, Maddie. Due to a staggering rate of unemployment, we suggest expansionary fiscal policy as opposed to contractionary fiscal policy because it places a greater emphasis on combating recessionary hiccups and not on inflationary. In other words, it lowers taxes and increases governmental spending, in turn benefiting the citizens on a more intimate level, supporting its infrastructure and achieving full employment. Hello, my name is Amy Kim and I am a geographer and I would like to share our first program with you. It is called Transportation Revolution and it addresses transportation development. With numerous complications revolving around public transportation, it is imperative to develop a more sophisticated system of paved and marked roadways. The roadways in Haiti provide little protection to ward off catastrophes, such as hurricanes, as well as other natural disasters. Just yesterday, January 12, 2010, a level 7 earthquake shook Haiti's foundation to its core, damaging not only buildings and power lines, but also weakening its means of communication. Once these standards are achieved, Many benefits can be seen. A permanent system of roads will make trade easier, more reliable, with faster access overall. It will also improve trade to other nations, both exports and imports. Haiti will cease to be cut off from the rest of the world. My name is Maddie Deering, and I am a historian here to talk on behalf of the Foundation called Healing Hands of Haiti. The program I am introducing addresses health care. Rising levels of unemployment, childhood deaths, in major diseases, the citizens' access to health care is increasingly limited and oftentimes non existent. Lowering taxes and increasing government spending will allow us the necessary funds to improve clinics, increase access to medical care, provide vaccinations, address water sanitation, malnutrition, and contraception. The Healing Hands of Haiti will promote its citizens to become healthier, in turn, improving their willingness to work and stimulate their economy with escalated human capital. Hello, my name is Abby Cohn. I am the economist for Haiti Policy Pitch, here to talk on behalf of a foundation called Fair Fight. The program that I am introducing addresses many of Haiti's basic human rights. I recommend imposing a range of national and international measures to readdress the negative effects that countless crises have had on Haiti's basic human rights, and also suggest the development of fiscal strategies, such as taxes and governmental spending, to ensure that particular attention is given to the needs and rights of the most vulnerable sectors of the population. With a decrease in taxes and an increase in governmental spending, aggregate demand forces GDP and its equilibrium prices upwards. We further state that human rights obligations take a more prevalent role in ensuring a continuous trend of non-discriminatory actions, such as putting in place adequate monitoring mechanisms to identify the emerging threats to human rights 
protecting citizens, and addressing the equal rights of all members of society. International human rights law requires multinational assistance, aid and cooperation to achieve the enjoyment of a relaxed society for all. This includes providing an enabling environment for national efforts to improve, particularly through international agreements concerning trade and intellectual rights. My name is Kelly Foley and I am an anthropologist here to talk on behalf of the Foundation College Education Nation. The program I am introducing addresses the importance of education to a society as a whole. Free public education is something most of us take for granted, but in Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, Private schools are the only schools, and very few families can afford. It is crucial to stress the absolute relevance of education to Haiti's continual success. To ensure this, we must provide incentives for children to attend school. Families should be assured that their children will be safe and provided with two meals a day. It is also crucial to educate the older population about technology, equality, and the importance of it in education to the future generations of Haiti. The opportunity cost of being sold into slavery to help support and or take the burden off your family is to go to school and obtain an education. Mr. Chairman, because our nation is operating under such high unemployment rates, we implore that you increase the aggregate demand by stimulating the money supply so that nominal interest rates fall and investment demand expands. Now take a look at these graphs. When the Fed conducts expansionary monetary policy, it is giving banks more funds to lend out. Thus, the supply of loanable funds shifts to the right. This lowers interest rates and increases the amount of loanable funds. In the charts, we move from point A to point B, and interest rates in the economy fall. So expansionary monetary policy lowers interest rates, while contractionary monetary policy raises interest rates. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you take our policies into careful consideration. This has been a presentation from ABC World News. Stay classy, San Antonio.